Now, let's take our Bibles tonight, and we're going to turn to one of the fours, Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, we said we had to learn the fours, Philippians 4, Ephesians 4, and James 4, okay? And now, Ephesians 4. Now, also tonight, just for the benefit of those that want it, on the back table, we have, uh, we have put that down the change sheet, okay? How to determine what my lusts are, okay? And with some instructions with it, so that, you know, in essence, if we get people up having a real relationship with God, now we have to pick off their lusts. So here is the change sheet. We, Pastor was gracious enough to make copies of it for you. If you want it, you can go back on the back table and Kim will have that for you, okay? Now, we only want you to have it if you want to have it, but this is a tool to help you to be able to make biblical long-term change in your life, okay? And, I, you know, you got to realize that, hey, we're serious about making change here. We're not just going through the motions. So if I'm going to make change, i got to figure out where I'm at. Amen? Okay, very important. All right. Let's stand together now as we read out of respect to God and His Word. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 19, and the Bible says, Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard Him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation or lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the what, folks? Deceitful lusts. Notice that? Okay, and be renewed in your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, uh, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity that we have to spend this time together. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher tonight. I submit myself to you now. I pray that my mind and my heart will be yours. I pray through the next few minutes that we'll learn something that will help our lives and God help our home. And I pray for your wisdom, your guidance, and your direction. I ask now for your, your, the, the person that might be here tonight who's unsaved, that they might come to know thee as Savior. And Lord, the person who's here tonight who is out of fellowship with you, Lord, refuses to look at their life to see where they are. I pray, God, that you'll help them to understand that they can't do anything apart from being out of, if they're out of fellowship with you. Now I pray, tonight you'll help me, I need your help. And through the next few minutes, God, that hearts will be opened, lives will be changed, minds will be touched. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. All right, now we've been talking about controlling your thought life. Okay? Talking about controlling your thought life. Now, what I want you to realize is there's going to be moments in a day where something is going to be really difficult. Maybe it's, a, you know, maybe it's uh, where Satan continues to bombard you with something. And you know, you've been turning it over and turning it over and turning it over, and, and the bombardment continues. Now, I want you to see what Jesus himself said about this. Okay? And I think it's very, very important for us. So turn back to John 14. Okay, John 14. And we'll come back here to 
uh, Ephesians, but I want you to look at John 14. Now, we've been, our, our counselees have, you know, when you have, when you have a lot of baggage in your life, and we're sorting through getting rid of that baggage, you know, lots of times things come up out of the past that really have been hurtful and painful and, you know, and uh, have really just given me a lot of uneasiness and worry and anxiety and fear and all that kind of thing. We, we, you know, we've had several people go through the counseling program with long COVID, okay, and they really struggled and they're, they're concerned that they'll never get over it, okay? And so we have to learn to trust God and live by faith rather than live in worry and anxiety and fear. But in those moments when you're really struggling and you've turned it over and turned it over and turned it over, and it's, you know, and, and you just need help at that moment, I want you to notice what the Bible says here in verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace. I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not, now notice, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, notice that when that verse says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. All right, now when let is used at the start, somebody's got to do what? Make a decision. So you're going to have to make a decision here now to not let your heart be troubled and let it not be afraid. Okay? But Jesus has told us what to do here. Now keep in mind, remember we've said the big player in the room is the Holy Spirit right now? Okay? Did you notice it says, but the Comforter? You notice the capital C there? Did you see it? Okay, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Okay, so one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is comforting you. Got it? One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is comforting you. And especially when difficult things that are happening are troubling your heart and mind. So, now, also I just want, for the purpose of understanding, I want to show you this. And, but look at this in verse uh, 26 where it says, He shall teach you all things. So now one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to teach you. So once I've dealt with my sin every day, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to teach me. Amen? Amen. Got it? Okay, I have to learn to ask God questions. So I'm going to ask Him to teach me, the Holy Spirit to teach me today. Give me His message for me today. Show me what He wants for me today rather than just mundanely going through, you know, and reading my Bible and not getting anything out of it. And when Pastor Bortner gets up and says, now you ought to read your Bible, and you should, but you're going to have to read the Bible, being in fellowship with God and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you. Y'all with me? Okay? Otherwise, you're going to fail. And your children are going to fail. Okay, if they don't get it, they're going to fail. And I want you to understand this. You know, my children are 47 maybe and 42. 40, 40, no, 43. <laughs> Boy, time flies when you're having fun. Now, think about what I just said. My children are 47 and 43. Well, they're, they're middle-aged adults. Okay? Now, that tells you that I'm a young guy, right? Okay. All right. And so, I, w I want you to understand that, you know, your children are only going to be in your home for a short time. Okay? Now you have that time to teach. Because once they move out of your home, you're going to have a lot less uh, 
you know, opportunity. Okay? You're, you're, in essence, your influence will become less. Irregardless. Now, can you imagine that there are people that are still telling their children what to do when they're 45, 46 years old? Okay? By now, you know, they should have learned what they need to, they should have learned what they needed to learn before they left your house. Okay? And so I have to realize now that this is extremely important and so that I have to teach them and I have to show them that the Holy Spirit wants to teach them. Amen? Don't negate this. Don't blow it off. Because if they don't learn to have a real, intimate, personal, and passionate relationship with God and allow the Holy Spirit to comfort them, to teach them, and all those kinds of things, they're going to fail. And you're going to be sad. Right? So now, it's, and by the way, that's the time to do it between the, you know, the age of zero to 20. Okay? Because later, you're just not going to have the influence that you had once. Now, I want you to get this. Now, let's go. Okay. He says here, the comforter. And notice what it says, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Whom the, now, I, I think it's important, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I, I want to go back over 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Now notice, peace. Now remember this morning, I showed you in Romans that God wants us to learn. He wants us to have hope. He wants us to have joy. And he wants us to have peace. Now peace is moment by moment. Okay? So when I'm dealing with something that is really hard to deal with, Rather than getting frustrated and angry, I have to stop. I need your help now. I want to turn this over to you. I would like to have the comfort of the Holy Spirit now. And I'd like your peace, please. Try it. All of our counselees that are working with this are saying, immediately, calm. Calm. It's like, wow. You know, so I'm no longer... <gasps> I would like to have the comfort of the Holy Spirit now, and I'd like to have your peace, please. God loves you so much that He wants you to have peace. All you got to do is ask. Be in fellowship with God and ask. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Okay? So I want to have the comfort of the Holy Spirit right now. And I want your peace, please. Amen? Amen. And it works. And our counselors are coming back saying, Man, I did that, Dr. Coomer, and wow. It was like... It just stopped. It's, it's like really, really peace. And Jesus promised it to me. So if Jesus promised it to me, amen, right? I want it. And remember, Jesus loved you so much, and he said, my peace I give unto you. In essence, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In essence, you're going to have to trust God by faith with these issues and turn them over to Him and not let your heart be troubled and afraid. So your children need to learn that. And you need to learn that. And you need to teach it to them. Amen? All right, now. By the way, we're, we're, we're Mr. Practicality Christianity 101. You know, instead of letting yourself get out of control, get upset, get mad, get hurt, yell, scream, rant, rave, stop. 
submit. Turn it over to God at the point of impact. And if something's really difficult, ask for the comfort of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. And ask for the peace that Jesus has promised you. Amen? Got it? And don't take this lightly. Okay, now, let's turn back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And so now, it's interesting here, because the Apostle Paul is saying, if you, uh, but you've not so learned Christ... And we're here tonight to learn Christ. And so, uh, when we get through this change sheet and we find out what their lusts are, uh, the Bi- we use the put-off, put-on method here that the Bible talks about in Ephesians 4, 22-24. So, in essence, anything that's seven or above on the list is a demand-lust controlling behavior. Okay, so now we're going to have to deal with it. Right, Ashley? Good. Hey, see, I remembered your name. Amen? Three times on names. (laughs) Corey, Cora. (laughs) Sorry. Okay, yes. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Sorry. All right. You have to tell me that again, too. All right, now. Think about it. Here we go. God wants now for you to learn what you're going to do with that lust. Now, I want to know, I want you, it says, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is what, folks? Corrupt your old nature. Wouldn't it have been great when we got saved that God took away our old nature, but he didn't? And God says that your old nature is what? Corrupt. It's deceitful. And notice it says, according to the deceitful lusts. Notice that lust is plural. Okay, now think. Deceitful lusts. Okay, you know what that word deceitful there means? Promising something it can't deliver. Okay? Promising something you can't deliver. Your lusts want to promise you peace. You're not going to get it that way. Okay? You're only going to get worry, anxiety, and fear, and pain, and agony, and all that kind of stuff. And your deceitful lusts tell you that you, if you do this, okay, you know, do what you want here, and guess what? It's not going to work. You're not going to have peace. You have to submit yourself. You have to be in fellowship with God. Ask the Holy Spirit to control you and fill you, and then ask for the peace. Now, so when we find it, we use this methodology. And look at verse 21, so they have to put it off. And look at verse 24, and put on... And, put the, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you've got to put off the old man and put on the new. The question is, how do you do that? And that's in verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now I want you to notice the first lust that comes out the door here. Okay? Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So what is the first lust? Come on. Lying. Lying's a lust. Have you ever met a chronic liar? Yes or no? Yeah? Someone can sit and look at you in the face and lie to you and not blink. Okay. had a young man in one of our churches that he was a chronic liar. And I always noticed that a lot of the men were back in the back, you know, before services starting all kind of in a circle, and he'd be in there and he'd be spinning a yarn. 
And I could see the guys going, oh, my gosh. You know, like, my goodness. And you know what he did? He told a lot of those lies to impress the girls. But do you think the girls were that dumb? But he thought he was a, you know, the cat's meow. Huh? You love cats? All right. Well, you wouldn't want him. All right. So, so, well, you know, Stephanie, I, I got to tell you something. <laughs> I always tell people wherever I go, <laughs> if you had a cat, you need to get right with God. Okay? I was like, oh, now I, one woman came up to me one time and said, you know, I, I liked you until you said that. <laughs> right, Lisa? Yeah. So, I want you to understand now, so he's, he's lying. I said, what do you, I asked him, you know, he came in for counsel. I said, what do you think about lying? What do you think about it? He says, oh, God, God doesn't like it. But see, the people who live for their lusts, they don't think they're all that bad. Okay? And it's just something that I like and, you know, blah, blah, or I'm doing, and I don't really care what anybody else thinks. You know, that kind of thing. It's not that big a deal. It is a big deal because it's putting you out of fellowship with God. And you don't even realize it. So I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Remember, put off, put on, change your mind. So I said, here's what we're going to do. I want you to look up five verses on lying. And I want you to write down two things. I don't want you to tell me what you think God thinks about lying. I want you to tell me what He really says about lying. And so... He, I had him write down five verses, look them up, write them down, and then write down two things that he learned or thought was important from each verse and memorize one verse. He came back in and I said, all right, what do you think God thinks about lying now? Oh, God hates it. Well, good. Now you're going to look up five more. Do the same thing. And we did five more 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 and did five more until we got to 50. He comes in and he says, Pastor, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. He says, how many verses are there in the Bible on lying? <laughs> I said, there's 96, and you're going to do them all. <laughs> now, what, so what happened was is that he was confronted by God's word on 96 different occasions, and he really now... So what happened was, look at verse 23, 23 with me, okay? And be renewed where? In the spirit of your what? Mind. So gradually what took place was is that he realized that this was sin. And he changed his behavior, amen? Okay? Now, you know, but he had to see it. And God had to use it to get into his heart and his mind. Now, in the Bible, the heart and mind is used interchangeably. So, he made change. And when he was done, he says, wow, whew, I was really bad, wasn't I, Pastor? I said, yeah, you really were. Making, so here it is, making biblical, long-term Change. Amen? That's how it's done. The put off, put on. You're deceived with that lust. You believe it's okay. Remember deceitful lust? You're deceived with it. Now you've got to be renewed in the spirit of mind. You've got to put it off and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the sheet is back there so you can grade yourself. Let me tell you this. Don't if you don't understand what a word means, look it up. Don't guess that you know what it's about. 
Okay? This is not for your wife to do about you. This is for you to do about you. It's not for your husband to do about you. And you're going to have to be honest before God. Without, without transparency, nothing will ever change in your life. Now, I want to show you one more thing about this, and then we're going to move on for a second, okay? I want you to turn back to... Uh, Let's turn back to Psalm 19. Turn back to Psalm 19. Yeah, that's what I want. Now, I want you to look with me at verse 13. It says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. All right, presumptuous sins. What's your name? Andy. Andy. I'm surprised you've been sitting on front row and I haven't talked to you yet. Okay, Andy. This word presumptuous is... Very interesting. Presumptuous sins. Okay, now think back about your, your lust. Okay? Now, so what's happening here is the person believes. So we'll say Andy finds out he's got this lust, and you know, and, but he didn't think it's all that bad. And so what he's doing, but it actually has dominion over you. See that in the verse? See it? It has dominion over him. He, he says, don't let this have dominion over him. But it has dominion over him. Control. Now, a presumptuous sin, ladies and gentlemen, is something that you're doing that you presume that God's not going to do nothing about. Now, I'm going to tell you now, I would not do that. Okay? So that you're presuming. So in essence, okay, the lusts, are involved in your presumptuous sins, believing that, presuming that God will never do anything about that. Now, if the Holy Spirit has been speaking about to you about your lust, what So I'll just presume that it's all right. Got it? And it ends up having what over you? Dominion. And you're presuming God will not do anything about it. I wouldn't do that at all. Now, let me say this to you. Let's turn back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Remember, everything starts in the mind, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now watch this carefully. Okay? The Bible here is telling us something. It says... For though Thank you. notice it says in Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now we're going to talk about your mind for a minute. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not what? Carnal. Now watch. But mighty through God to the pulling down 
of strongholds. Now strongholds has, that's a very interesting word. So where are the strongholds going to be at? In your mind. Okay, in your mind. Now, I'm going to give you the definition of strongholds. Figuratively, a heavily fortified containment and is used of a false argument in which a person seeks shelter or a safe place to escape reality. So on our intakes forms, we ask this question. Do you ever wish that you were living in a different time or different place? Turn it on. Is it on now? Yeah. All right, got it. Here we go. All right, now, have you ever thought about the fact that Did you want to, you think about being living in a different place or at a different time with a different woman, with a different man? Strongholds. Now, notice that it says, and, and I want to go back up in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. So you're not going to win anything in the Christian life by walking in the power of the flesh. The only way this works is if you walk in the power of the Spirit. Okay, but everything starts where? My mind. And in the Bible, the mind and heart are used interchangeably. So now I'm going to have to take control of my mind and not let it control me. Okay? And so I have to understand, think about this. I have the Holy Spirit living in me. I have the power. If I want to control it, I can control it. If I don't want to and I want to be lazy, I'll live in the power of the flesh. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. We got mighty weapons. We have the Holy Spirit of God living in us, and we have all the power that we need if we'll just learn to submit. And so, when a thought comes to your mind, listen, an ungodly thought, um, uh, you know, uh, a moral thought, immediately, stop. I'm not going there. I want to turn this over to you. I want to submit myself. What do you want me to praise you for? What do you want me to thank you for? And if it really keeps coming back and coming back and coming back, I want the comfort of the Holy Spirit right now and I want your peace, please. So that I'm not going to let things get into my head as strongholds. In essence, you know, wishing I wasn't here, wishing I wasn't there, wishing I wasn't married to her, wishing I wasn't married to him. Get it? And whenever that thought comes up, so they think it's a safe place. Okay? They think nobody else knows, Pastor. Guess what? I got news for you. God knows. And so when you think that way, you're out of fellowship with God. And horrible things can happen. Because you've opened all your port windows. Now, would it not be the best idea that you would teach that to your children before they leave your home? Rather than have to deal with the disaster that takes place after? Got it? It's just not getting them to memorize verses. I'm not against memorization. But if I'm going to memorize a verse, I better know what it's about. The Bible in Psalm 1 says that God blesses Bible meditators, doesn't bless my Bible memorizers. So, if I, you know, and so in essence, when God gives me His message today, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to look at that. I'm going to read it over again. And I'm going to read it over again. 
I'm going to read it over again. And I'm going to thank God for his message for me today, and I'm going to write it down. Okay? So I'm meditating upon that verse, or meditating upon that thought that God has given me today, so that I recognize very clearly, I'm going to take control of my mind here and not let it control me. Amen? i got to take control of my dark side. And everybody has one. So I have to take control of my dark side. God wants you to do that. Now look at verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God Bringing into captivity, how many thoughts, folks? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. How many thoughts? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. So I have to take control of my dark side. I have to take control and not strongholds control my mind. God wants you to learn. He wants you to have hope. He wants you to have joy. And He wants you to have peace. And He's given you the Holy Spirit and He's given you tools to use. And if I don't use them, Andy, I'm going to fail. And then I'm going to wonder, what in the world happened here? And you're going to be hurt. Look, we are in what we do, most of the people who come to us are in performance-based, doer mentality Christianity. They think that they're Spiritual by what they do. Now I'm telling you now, you're not spiritual by what you do, you're spiritual by what you be. And then if you be, then you'll do right. Okay? But you, you know, so in essence, remember I said there will be people who came in this morning who said, I'm in fellowship with God because I was in church today. That's not necessarily true. Glad you're here in church today, but that may not be necessarily true. Okay, so in essence, I have to be vigilant. I have to be decisive. I have to think it's very important that I deal with my fellowship with God every single day and every moment of every day that I can be a spirit-controlled person and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I can rejoice in the Lord when? Always. And again, I say rejoice. So we got mighty weapons. So let, let God do great and mighty things in your life. And when you see God do great and mighty things in your life, one of the things I was telling Pastor on the way over, and I'm, I'm going to finish with this. Um, we have to learn to ask God questions. So, three of the questions we tell our counselees to ask at the end of their devotions is, oh, four actually, what can I praise you and thank you for? I know, write that down. Who do you want me to encourage today? Who do you want me to encourage today? Now, wouldn't it be neat, Andy, if you was going to think about that and encourage somebody today? I had, a, I had a guy in the, in the church that we attend when we're home, and I asked God, who do you want me to encourage today? And he's been struggling with a lot of work problems and a lot of different things, and so here we're getting ready to go to the airport, and I just, you know, I'd called, but he didn't answer, so I didn't, you know, he's been very busy, and I don't want to bother him, but God had told me to be an encouragement to him today. So pretty soon, you know, I'm getting, we're getting dressed, getting ready to go to the airport, and, and I get a phone call from him. And so I said, hey, you know what? God 
spoke to my heart about you today. And I just wanted you to know that God wanted me to encourage you today. And he said, oh man, you don't know how much that helps me. He said, I want, thank you. He said, you know, I've really been struggling at work. I've really been struggling with this. I'm really struggling with that. And, and I said, you know, so we talked for a little bit, for a few minutes. I couldn't talk for a long time. And I gave him John 14, 26, and 27 and explained to him how to do it. He said, that really is helpful for me. Thank you. He said, I'll be praying for you. He said, man, he said, you don't know how much your phone calls helped me today. God bless you. And he said, I'll be praying for you. You have a good meeting in that church and that God will work in hearts and lives. And I said, that's great. So he got on the phone, depressed, defeated, and discouraged. He got off the phone saying, praise God, thank you for helping me. Just a few minutes. What do you want me to encourage? Who do you want me to encourage today? Who do you want me to witness to today? Got it? And by the way, if God tells you to go witness to Tom or Julie or whoever, well, you better get over and get it done. Because that means the Holy Spirit's preparing their heart. Right, Lisa? Now, Lisa had the opportunity to lead 52 people to the Lord in this past year. And you know what she uses? Who do you want me to witness to today? Amen? So that we get real about our relationship with God. And then, so, I ask God um, who he wanted me to witness to today. And we're in a rest. We're in a we're in a restaurant. McDonald's. And I was in Mansalona, Michigan. And Mansalona is a very small town. Six o'clock. There were no restaurants that were open that they had, and the only one that was open was a McDonald's. So we went to the McDonald's. Me and a young man from the church. And we go to this McDonald's and. I said, okay, we got our drinks, and I said, all right, why don't you, uh, why don't you, uh, uh, you get the drinks, and, and I'll go back, and I'll look back and see if there's a place for us to sit. It was a pretty decent size of McDonald's. And so we, I go back and look, and I, there's nobody back there, and I said, Lord, I know you've brought me here to help people, and if there's somebody you want me to help right now, and, or witness to right now, I don't know anybody here, but you bring him by me. He said, he's coming. So I walked back up front, and I'm standing by the young man from our church. Another, this young man walks in the door, walks up. Young man from our church is over here. He walks up, stands right beside me. And I looked over him and said, hey. And he said, hi. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. He said, are you a preacher? I said, yes. And he said, I need help. Well, I thought that was really quick, Pastor, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so we got our food, and we went back. And an hour later, he got saved. I want to live my life with God leading it, not my flesh leading it. I want to see God do great and mighty things in my life. Let God do great and mighty things in your life by submitting yourself to Him. Let Him teach you. Learn what He has for you to have hope, joy, and peace. Amen? Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and the pianist is coming. And you know...